Good morning, my pretties. Welcome to the Meta Cafe. Happy Halloween. Grab your coffee or your tea. Sit back, relax, and let's chat about what is going on this morning in the stars and the planets that would make Janet dress like this. I don't think it was just Halloween this morning, guys. <laughs> uh, I really think that I suddenly, suddenly got bit by the moon in Leo, who likes, of course, to do things different in a dramatic flair. And uh, that's me this morning, right? I woke up and I thought, hmm, it's Halloween. I could probably get away with dressing up. And so I did, right? So you get to see me as you never get to see me. Probably won't see me like this again until next Halloween. <laughs> Uh, so, and I have my sidekick with me this morning. Let me see if I can move over and you can see my husband made up SpongeBob for me. Like he looks like zombie Bob. He's got a knife. He's got blacked out teeth. He's got X's in his eyes. So he's my, he's my, my, my partner in crime this morning. He's my little mini me. So I hope all of you woke up this morning having thoughts of fun and play, making this a lighter day. And uh, even though we are in some ways celebrating death, we are also celebrating rebirth. And sometimes the best way to do that is to greet it with some humor and some fun. Thus, the reason we get to dress up and pass out sweets and candies. And I'm sure there are a whole lot of other things that we could talk about as far as Halloween or Samhain, as it's called. Suzanne, you could probably regale us with tales of uh, what Halloween is all about from your um, belief system. And, you know, there's a lot of juiciness around the day today. But I guess what some people don't realize is that it spills over into November 1st, which in the Catholic tradition is All Saints Day. Uh, but it is literally the time right as we cross the midnight threshold where the dead arise, right? Where the uh, transformations can take place, right? where the dead can walk the earth. And uh, I don't know. I don't know about all that. I just know about the fun part. And today we're going to talk about uh, the astrology of the day, because it's actually quite a busy day from the astrological point of view. But it is also the beginning almost of the next month. And we have a lot to talk about in, in terms of what's coming up for November. So let's just say a real quick good morning to everybody. Good morning, Londa. There's a parade in Edison today. Ooh um, Edison is a little town that's just to my east. And uh, it's a really quaint little place with little shops and little eateries. It's really kind of a fun place to go. Good morning, Colleen. Happy Halloween to you. Good morning, Tam. She says, I'm cracking her up. You even look beautiful and crazy hair and makeup. So this is funny. So I send a picture of myself to my granddaughter this morning because I thought if anybody's going to know about makeup, it's going to be her. And I, so I sent her a, a picture and I said, is this, a, is this too much? <laughs> And she didn't answer me until after I was already done. And she's like, no, it's perfect, Grandma. <laughs> I said, okay, great. So, um, you know, getting advice from your 15-year-old grandchildren, priceless. Good morning, Vanita. Thank you. I look awesome. Good morning, Jennifer Peachy. Good morning, Mimi and Michelle and everybody that's out there. I hope you're all dressed up. And I hope you're all anticipating having a fun day. Um, I actually live in a place where there's never very many trick-or-treaters. In fact, I think in the 10 years or so that I've lived here on this island, I've maybe had one bag of candy that uh, I've ever even broken into for the trick-or-treaters. And that doesn't mean I don't have candy that I break into and eat, but um, for trick-or-treaters, we just don't get very many of them. But apparently this year, somebody sent around a memo to all the people that live on the island and said, hey, you know, if you're going to be passing out candy, we have more kids living here now. And, you know, we want to let them know where they can go. And so uh, the house in front of me, she um, put her address on the list. And then she said to me later, would you like me to, you know, send kids back to you? And I said, yes, please do. So I'm dressed up not only for myself and for you all this morning, but for the kids who will more than likely be at my door at some point this evening. And of course I had to go buy new candy, uh, to pass that out to them. So, but whatever they don't take, I will certainly try not to eat, but 
that's a whole nother story. So here we are today with the moon in Leo all day long. There is no, you know, change ha happening, no void of course moon that we need to worry about this today. So this is just a day to have fun, to play, but watch out for a few of, you know, the drama queens and drama kings, you know, that the ones that are, you know, you know the story, right? When the moon's in Leo, sometimes there's that one person who's at the Halloween party, drunker than a skunk and falls down and kill, you know, hurts himself hurt someone else. And so be, be watching for, you know, dramas. Don't participate in the dramas, just have fun, right? Today, the sun and the moon reach a 90 degree angle with one another, a square. And this is a point of crisis. Remember when we talk about the moon, the relationship between the moon and the sun, we're talking about, you know, a conjunction that is the new moon, the first 90 degree angle, the, the first square, which is usually just one week later. And that we call the crisis of action. It's that I sent an, I set an intention at that new moon. And now I'm being like tasked with what is it that I want to do next? Maybe a block has shown up in my pathway. Maybe um, some kind of limitation has shown up. And now I'm ready to just give it all up. Um, but this is the first, that's the first test, right? The crisis of action. What do I do? How do I keep aligned with my intention and my things that I wanted to do? The next point, of course, is the full moon. We just had the full moon. So today we are at the last 90 degree angle, which becomes the crisis of consciousness. And here it is a point in time where we're able to go, okay, I have this thing, this creation. Is it something that is worthwhile? You know, did it turn? Is it looking like this is something that is supportive? Is this something that is, um, you know, a, a way for me to serve? Is it working? Because if it's not at this point, you can look at the consciousness of what it is you have created and decide whether there's something you want to change about that right now, or maybe it is maladaptive. Maybe that what you thought it was going to be is totally not what it was going to be. So it brings up a time of adjustment for us. We can adjust. No one ever said that whatever you said as an intention had to stay that intention, right? We we sometimes think of it that way. It's like, oh God, I said this and this is how it's going to be. But that's not the right way to work with life, right? Life changes and morphs and conditions change. So we may be facing a point in time where conditions have changed based on what we thought it was that we were going to create. And this is a great time to add more consciousness to it. And, and by that, I mean, sometimes the best way to add more consciousness is to step back and be the observer. Right? Be in the observation mode just to look in and say, if, if this was someone else looking in, what would they see and how would they um, decide what to do next? So that's the kind of day we have, although I would think that today a lot of the fun and the office parties or, you know, just the, the celebration may take that over and it may not be, be such a great thing. But if for some reason one of you comes up against this, you know, change that you might have to make in a plan that you were working, that would be the cause of it, right? And just greet it, take it in, try to step back and be an observer. Don't blow it up. Don't, you remember, don't blow things up. This is the time where the sun is at gate 44 and we're creating bridges from the past into the future. And to create that bridge, sometimes we have to take the best from the past. We can leave in the past the things that don't work right now and bring forward the best, join it with the best of the new so that we have a, uh, uh, a new now, let's call it. Okay, today, Venus is at zero degrees of Scorpio. And Uranus is at zero degrees of Taurus. And Mercury is at zero degrees of Sagittarius. Do you see a pattern here? Zero, zero, zeros. Full of potential right? The zero energies are full of potential. <clears throat> In astrology, the 29th degree and the, the zero degree are called karmic degrees. Karmic, not because, you know, we're going to rehash old stuff and, you know, get beaten up or anything like that. It's karmic degrees as in when you are standing at 29 degrees, you have the viewpoint across the whole of the sign that you've just moved through. So yesterday, day before when Venus and Mercury and, and Uranus were at the 29th degree of their relative signs, then we might have been able to see, you know, backwards. Now, well, actually, they're never mind. 
that the zero degree gives us the opportunity to look ahead. It gives us the opportunity to have hope and optimism as we look toward a brighter future or as we look down the road. Remember every, you know, don't you do this too when a new month begins? Don't you like, aren't you like, oh, yay, a new one, right? So something new might be able to be brought forward. Um, there can be some changes. Somehow the, the changing of the calendar can um, create a space for us, an opening. Same Likewise, with the signs, when a planet moves into a new sign, a new road ahead of pot of possibilities and potential opens up for us. So what does that look like? Well, I'm going to break it down by planets and uh, also the connections that they're making, because I think there's juiciness in each of the little pieces to talk about. So let's first deal with Venus at zero degrees of Scorpio. Obviously, She's retrograde. We've known this for a while in what, September, she actually moved into the retrograde zone. And right now she is sitting um, at, at, she's, oops, dang it. Of course, I forgot to turn my phone down today because I had, I was going to play Halloween music for everybody, <laughs> but I couldn't figure out how to make it work with the mic. And yeah. So anyway, I gave up the Halloween music in favor of um, just talking and <laughs> forgot to turn my phone off. I apologize. So Venus is she's, she's toggling right here at the very beginning of uh, Scorpio. She's at zero degrees, uh, six minutes, is it? Like just, just barely over the line uh, into at, at Scorpio. And she's in retrograde. So she's going to be moving backwards to the 29th degree of Libra. She does that later this afternoon. So right now where we sit, she's at zero Scorpio in retrograde, but moving backwards. And as she moves backwards, she's going to recall us back to a period of time where she sat at the same spot, where she was just about ready to leave Libra to get into Scorpio. And here she is now in Scorpio, ready to leave Scorpio backward into Libra. And the date for you on that was September 10th and 11th. And at this point, if you can go back and if you can think about the, the, the issues that might have been coming up for you in your relationships, in your money, um, in your values, what, what was on your screen, what was on your radar at that point in time. I know that's a ways to look back, but often, you know, these uh, sign changes create instances that remain with us. Like I might be able to go back to my calendar and go, oh yeah, I remember what was going on that day. And you could, you know, make connections. And of course, another way to do that is to look at your astrology chart at the house that this is happening in. What is it retrograding backwards into? And what are the values around that? So I'm going to, I'm going to share with you a, a little bit from my life on that, just because, um, that's maybe a way for you all to open up and look at this. So back, remember Venus here rules values, what you value, your money, and also your relationships, your love relationships, your business partnerships, etc. Well, back around September 10th, uh, I was a little bit worried about, I was, I was worried about money, I believe at that point in time. But I was more worried about, I think it was around that time that my daughter had discovered she wasn't going to be able to sell me her house, or it wasn't going to work out the way that I thought it was going to work out, and I'm going to stay living here. And I realized in that moment that I hadn't really ever felt home here. Like, I feel home here. I, I mean, I feel good here. It's not that, but I hadn't really claimed it. And so I hadn't really said, okay, this is my home because my viewpoint had been, this was temporary. And so everything about how I lived in this house was based on that temporariness. Do you understand what I mean? I hadn't really claimed it and settled in and been like, this is where I'm going to be. So in my case, that is happening right across the fourth house, the fourth house of home foundation being in, you know, putting down roots. And so it was funny because this morning I, or not this morning, it was about a week ago, I was looking for my Halloween decorations and I couldn't find them. I called my daughter. I go, did I leave them at your house or did I give them to you? Or what did I do with them? I still haven't found my Halloween decorations because what I probably did was threw them away when I moved, knowing that I was going to be living in a completely different place at some point, And I would want to buy Halloween decorations to fit that place. I think I remember thinking that. 
So here we are with this back in our faces, right? These decisions that we made. On that day, the decision I made was this is now home, right? No matter what, this is home. I don't know for how long I'm going to be here. I don't know if it's, you know, another month from now. I don't know if it's five more years from now. I don't know, but I'm going to live here as if this is my home. I'm going to make a claim to it. And so I'm going to live like this is my home. So you see how astrology works, right? The house that it's in was all about home and family and putting down roots. And the transit, you know, passes by, wakes you up to something, goes on and moves into a new territory. Now it's backing back up. And when it comes to these, you know, specific points, these are like hot spots, if you will, you know, like a hot spot of a volcano or a hot spot where you, you, this is a place where there's something that is going to shift and change. And isn't it interesting that today is, you know, I'm looking at the first of the month again, I'm going to be paying my next month's rent. And it is all about, yes, right now I'm like, yes, this is where I'm going to stay. This means something. So in your own life, this is going on somewhere in, in you know, whether it's your relationships, your values, etc. So questions, anybody about that? Um, good morning, Cornelia. I love you. Hey, do you remember this outfit, Cornelia? Because this wig came from you. Uh, that's so funny that you joined us this morning. Um, Gail says, I love your new style, our hairstyle. Thank you very much. Um, it's itchy. So like I just, you know, I, I can't wait to get it off. Um, wait, wait, look, what time ago? Look at what time ago. Okay, Michelle Gay, I don't know what you mean. So write something else. Oh, for Venus. Yes, for Venus, September 10th and 11th. That was the last date that the planet was sitting at the degree she's at right now, where she was changing, though, from the 29th degree of Libra to the zero degree of Scorpio. Now she's changing from zero Scorpio backwards to the 29th degree of Libra, right? Michelle Brooks, good morning. Okay, so I don't see any real questions there. Londa, uh, it's not me. I don't know what that means. Maybe you're talking to someone else. Anyway, so... Now, what else can we expect? So Venus is also in a opposition, an opposition today, a 180 degree angle, right? So a line, they're exactly opposing one another, Uranus in Taurus and Venus in Scorpio. So we have this tension that's building up, the tension of opposites, right? So what can we expect? Well, typically, typically, in a Venus opposing Uranus. And you could have been feeling this a couple of days behind here, you know, as this was picking up, you maybe have experienced it another day or so from now, where there appears to be sort of a, a surprise that occurs in your relationships, or an aha or an awakening about what is going on in your relationships. Now that can be your personal relationships, love relationships, marriage, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, but it can also be about your business partnerships and the, the partnerships that you have in play. Um, and in, in this case, you may have to, you, things may have been turned upside down so that you could see them more clearly. Like, you know, that, that we've been going along and we're in this relationship, everything seems fine. And then something crystallizes and you in that moment, see through the glass darkly, or maybe through the glass brightly, right? It's so obvious to you now what is going on in this relationship. And so it can be upsetting. It can be surprising and it can create tension. It can create, especially if there are unresolved tensions between you and another person, whether that's in the workplace, whether that's in your home, whether that's in your family, whether that's with your loved ones, uh, your beloved, your spouse or your significant other. And those unresolved tensions in the relationship may be the source or the cause of the upsets. So just being aware, try not to try, try, try not to get into reaction, right? That knee jerk or that, that um, blow up kind of reaction with that can cause more trouble and um, not really be, you know, usually what comes out of our mouth in the heat of the moment isn't really what we, it may be what we really wanted to say, you know, based on our egos, but it isn't the heart centered thing to say. So, you know, today we may want to stay away from any major discussions or any big upsetting, um, you know, conversations around that. Keep it, you know, kind of in your, the back of your mind um, for you to be reflecting on. Remember, we're still Scorpio. We're still Taurus energy here. It's still deep. And then let the retrograde 
as we keep moving backwards into, because Uranus is also retrograde, and let the retrograde reveal to us what the next steps are going to be. Um, another more fun expression of Venus opposing Uranus is exactly this, right? Dressing up, <laughs> breaking from the norm, stepping out of the, you know, conforming sort of energy that we normally are in. Be fun, be flirty, have a great time. If you're going to a party tonight, you know, let the party girl out. Um, if you're going to, you know, be with a group of friends, you know, make sure it's a fun time. Don't be, you know, into the darky sides of things. Let's just be a little bit lighter and fun. Um, Venus in uh, Scorpio, zero degree Scorpio, like I said, later this afternoon, she moves back into retro, she retrogrades backwards into Libra. And uh, that is where it is that I was speaking about the energies from September 10th and 11th coming back up in your face. And you may want to consciously go there ahead of time so it doesn't come back and surprise you a little bit later on. Um, and when I say later on, it is more like one o'clock uh, on the West Coast. So four o'clock in the afternoon for you all on the East Coast. Um, be able to bring some consciousness to this. Now, adding to sort of the interestingness of the day is that Mercury is also at zero degrees today, although not in retrograde. Mercury is moving forward in its retrograde zone. So we're already in the shadow, the pre-shadow of retrograde uh, Mercury um, at zero degrees of Sagittarius. And, you know, Mercury, we, we talked a bit yesterday, we talked about the whole day, actually, uh, or the whole of the show, we talked about Jupiter in Sagittarius, what that was going to mean for us, what the transit through Jupiter uh, in Scorpio was leaving us with, and how would we move forward? Well, Sagittarius is a sign of optimism and growth and expansion. It does really well with, Mer with uh, Jupiter there. How does it do with Mercury there? Well, Mercury before when it moves into a sign before a big planet. So Jupiter doesn't move in until November 8th. So Mercury is seeding the energies that Jupiter will pick up on and magnify as it moves down the line. So this is a really great time for you all to be noticing what is Mercury bringing for you? What kind of ideas are coming up for you? I don't want you taking action on them yet, but what kind of ideas or creative urges are coming up? What's opening up for you? Um, because Mercury in the seed planting stage is maybe planting new ideas, maybe something you see in your outer world and you go, wow, that would be great to do. Um, he is planting in us the bigger picture thinking, right? So Mercury often is about the mind and the mind tends to be more, you know, in the, in the, uh, not as a hierarchy, but the lower mind is what Mercury rules. So the thinking mind, right? The analyzing mind, the logic mind. And uh, so what we would say is it's the lower mind, everything that we think of about thinking, where the higher mind would be more in, in connection with spirit. Does that make sense? And a completely different planet um, taking care of that kind of thing. So when we're looking at Mercury, the mind, we have optimism, we have this big picture idea, but I don't want you taking action yet because today's just not a great day to make those decisions about what's happening. Give, your, give Mercury a couple of days here in the new sign, see where it's leading. And remember, it is changing backwards to uh, retrograde as we move into November. So it isn't going to be a great time anyway to take action. So just pay attention, be uber aware, right? Be uber aware, maybe take notes. Even if you're not a journaler, become a journaler, use our wonderful, you know, little artist uh, drawings that Tam is providing for us uh, for the test group. You guys can do this anyway. And, you know, follow the threads and see what's going on. This is, if you're not working with the pictures, it's still okay. Just be paying attention. What's opening up for you? right? Because that's going to give you some clues as to where you go next. And then of course, as Mercury does, it moves retrograde. It moves retrograde on November 16th after Jupiter's only been in there seven days. <laughs> so they're going to crisscross. And so I don't think that November is a great month to make big decisions or to make big course corrections, but the seeds are being planted for exactly that. So I hope that makes sense to everybody. Um, today, 
one of the reasons I say it is not a great day to make big decisions is because Uranus and Mercury are in a real sort of scritchy connection with one another. They're in what is called an inconjunct. And an inconjunct is what we also call a yod. Sometimes when it forms the whole of the configuration of the yod, it is the one side of the yod. And it's a part of that configuration that brings up the need for adjustment, for sacrifices and for letting things go right? Like maybe you just realize suddenly I'm not in any kind of way, shape or form control of this situation. And so the best course of action is to surrender, right? Surrender. So the 150 degree angle is an energy that puts signs that have no real affinity or like for one another together. They're drawn together into a relationship when, um, you know, they, they can't even speak the same language. <laughs> so if you can't speak the same language, then, you know, there's a bunch of sign language going on and a lot of room for misinterpretation. So be very careful today about making any kinds of big decisions because the interpretation between the mind, Mercury and Uranus, not there, not there in a way that's supportive. So we want to be very cautious. All right. What's everybody thinking out here? Any questions going on? No questions. Wow. So either I'm dazzling you with my brilliance today or uh, everybody's stunned into silence. I'm not sure which. If you have questions, please feel free to write them down there. Gail says, I love that surrender energy. Absolutely. It is one of the tougher things, I think, for us to do because we're so conditioned to take action. We are really very conditioned to think that what we have to do is do something. <laughs> where where did beingness go, right? Sometimes you just have to be, and you just have to be able to surrender any ideas, any thoughts, any actions that you wanted to take um, to the greater divine, um, because there's obviously something you're not seeing yet, right? That's something that hasn't quite coalesced, something that hasn't, all the pieces aren't on the board yet, and if they're not all on the board yet, do you really want to push forward knowing that the um, the uh, possibility for having to sacrifice or adjust is huge? So let it be. Just let it be and surrender anything that is like you don't want to be in the process of forcing or pushing. Last thing you want to be doing today. And even for another couple of days, like I said, I, you know, give, give, give Mercury some time in Sagittarius to, you know, bring up some things out of the dark. You know, we've been Mercury and a lot of planets, right? We had Mercury, Venus, and Jupiter all in Scorpio, down in the deep, down in the dark. And now they're all, you know, departing out of Scorpio. The only thing going to be left in Scorpio uh, as we get into the first week of November is going to be the sun. And so we still are dealing with some of the deeper, darker, but now it's bubbling up to the surface what all of that work has been about. Why did we have to spend so much time in the dark? Well, because once we come up out of the dark, we're healed in a new way. We are healed or we, that we see new possibilities. Something new is sitting there for us. So anyway, not a great day to make decisions, but a great day to listen in uh, the next few days to listen in, to uh, bring in what's, you know, what is the wind whispering to you, right? All right. So good morning, Lynn. Good morning, Holly. Good to see you ladies out there. And um, did you guys know that Lynn Goldberg, who's fairly new to us here, does readings? She does card readings with that deck of cards, the beautiful faces, the 64 faces cards. And I, I chanced upon her um, uh, doing a live Facebook video the other day. Um, I think it was on Monday. She was doing the video. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I'm going to bring her on the show. We're going to talk a little bit later today about when, because I want to introduce her to you and have her do some readings and let you all experience having readings with her. So that's something coming here in the next couple of, uh, maybe, maybe, the, maybe we'll do it this week and maybe it'll be next week. I don't know, but be aware she's going to be on the show and I hope she brings her cards with her. Lynn, bring your cards with you because we absolutely love I do love that deck. I hope you all too. I've been trying to share. She uh, takes snapshots and gives me the picture and the description. And then I've been putting that on the Living Astrology Facebook page. So if you've missed that, go back to the Living Astrology page, page, you know, scroll down, 
and you'll see the cards, the beautiful cards. Gosh, um, this is a deck by a Rosie Aronson, I believe is her name. I'm also working to try to get her on the show so that we can talk to her about what, you know, this, what was this about for her? I love getting that kind of insight from people as well. Uh, like what motivated her to do this and where did this artistic energy come from? Where did all this beauty and this color come from? So anyway, Lynn will be joining us sometime very soon and hopefully Rosie as well. Um, so let's take a look ahead, right? This is a great day. We're sitting here at the cusp of a new month. We might as well take a look at what's going on in the month coming up. Um, so I'm going to give you the big dates astrologically. You can write some notes. I think I also will do a blog post at some point today uh, and get that out there. And uh, I'll be also supplying that to Tam. So she'll be able to, um, you know, do some art if she so wishes on that. Um, so we start very early in the month with uh, June or June. Oh my goodness. November 6th, Uranus retrograding backwards into Aries. And that is also election day in the United States. So some of you who are in the other parts of the world, this won't have much meaning to you, except that Uranus turning retrograde or Uranus being retrograde and changing signs takes us back to that very revolution oriented energy that we had experienced with Uranus and Aries. And of course, it's going to be at the 29th degree as it backs in, right? It goes from zero degrees into the 29th degree, a karmic degree. And that karmic degree happening on the day of the election. Wow. Karma rides a broom, right? Or what is that saying? Karma is a bitch and she rides a broom, something like that. <laughs> and here we come, right? There's this energy of revolution. I, I've i already talked to you all about the chart for the election. I think I'll probably bring that back up as you know we go into the month of November. But November 6th, banner day, Uranus retrograding backwards into Aries, bringing back this idea of revolution. And I, I am guaranteeing that that in some way is reflected in the actual um, results from the election. So whether that's good news or bad news for you, it doesn't really matter. It is that revolution is still in play. Um, on November 8th, two days later, the get the giant planet of our solar system, uh, Jupiter, moves into the sign of Sagittarius. Yay! So we have a year's worth now, beginning then, uh, a year's worth of Jupiter in very optimistic, growth-oriented, um, spiritual um, Jupiter or Sagittarius. Now, yesterday I shared some of the issues that could come up with Jupiter in Sagittarius, the tendency to overindulge, right? To overexpand, to go too far too fast without a real foundation um, that was built first. Saturn in Capricorn helps us with that foundational energy so that hopefully Jupiter comes into Sagittarius and moves us toward uh, uh, growing in a very new direction, um, returning us to values, common core values, uh, without the self-righteous leaning that can happen from those people who, the zealot type energy. We talked a little bit about that too. So it signals a big change in our energy and the dynamic out of the dark of Scorpio and into the light of Sagittarius. On the 15th, this is probably another banner day that I hadn't really thought about yet until this morning as I'm writing things down that I wanted to talk about. And that is that Mars, that has spent an inordinate amount of time in Aquarius, moves out of Aquarius and into the sign of Pisces. Remember, we got a taste of Mars and Aquarius back when it was um, preparing for its retrograde. And then it turned retrograde, moved out of Aquarius, backward into Capricorn. And then it moved forward in September, I believe it was, uh, yeah, or October, excuse, no, 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 August 27th, it moved back to direct, moved forward again into Aquarius, where it has been ever since. And now in 15th of November, it'll be moving into Pisces. Now you take a action oriented, oriented fire planet, and you put it in a very watery, intuitive sign, like Pisces. So what is we what do we get? fire and water, steam, steam. So we have some steaminess coming in that middle of the month. And it's interesting to me because I think Mars, when I think of Mars and Pisces, I think of um, 
passive aggression, right? I think of things going on behind the scenes, right? Actions that are being taken in secret even, or, um, and, and not necessarily, you know, um, not necessarily bad things going on behind the scenes, but just things that we don't see that, you know, the, for, you know, the while four to six weeks while Mars is moving through Pisces, there's not a whole lot that we're going to be able to see. And our actions may feel like a little bit like slogging. Uh, it may take a lot of more energy to get anything done. So we'll be looking at that a little closer um, as we move uh, into November. On the 16th, Banner day, circle on your calendar. Venus turns direct at 25 degrees Libra. Hallelujah. And Mercury, not so hallelujah, turns retrograde at 29 degrees of Sagittarius. So it's an interesting day, right? The planet of values and relationships and money moves forward while the communication planet, uh, the planet of travel and the planet of our mind moves backwards. So we'll have to watch that day and see how that plays out. The 22nd, we're looking at the sun moving into Sagittarius, joining Jupiter and and uh, is still Mercury at that point in retrograde in Sagittarius, putting a lot of focus then on that Sagittarius energy and wherever that is in your chart, seeking growth, seeking expansion. So we'll want to be paying attention to that. The last thing, big thing anyway, for November is Neptune turning direct. It has been retrograde since June or early July. I think it was actually late June and it turns direct on the 24th. And remember back at that point in time, I reminded you all that when Neptune turns retrograde, we become very much more attuned to our intuition. It's more like we can hear better, see better, feel better, know better, um, from a deeper place than we can at other times. And so whatever those little impulses, those little voices that have been talking to you, that inner, that inner dynamic, it's been speaking to you for the last, what, five months, June, July, August, September, October, November, five months, it's been in retrograde. And if you have neglected to take action based on intuitive impulses, now is your time. Because I swear to you, by the time this planet goes direct, you will be regretting that you didn't take action on those things that have been coming up, those repeat patterns, those repeat things, right? So even though I said earlier in the broadcast here, it's not a great day to make decisions. If there's something that's been niggling at you and coming up and you've just been sort of ignoring it or shoving it to the back of your mind, um, you may want to take a look at that again. You may want to pull it out of the dust and, you know, off the dusty shelf bring it back into your focus, look at that and see, is there something really about this that I need to take action on? Okay. Because by the time you get to November 24th, it's probably going to be too late, right? The benefit then will have passed you by. So that's what just a little less than a month. So pull out your old ideas, right? Look at that. Neptune turning direct is a good time. I don't want you to think it's always going to be a bad time to have Neptune indirect. It's not because things that have been hidden from us also become exposed, right? The things like uh, conspiracy theories and so forth, you know, the grain of truth in that comes out, right? So we have some dawning ahas perhaps coming to us as Neptune turns direct on the 24th. Now, any questions here? If not, um, I was told D. I don't know what that means, Gail. Hun. T tell, you know, tell me something else about that. Good morning, Kristen. It's good to see you. Good morning, Kathy, my stepmama. And Lynn, awesome. Lynn says, awesome. Thanks so much, Janet. How wonderful to have Rosie Aronson on as well. She hasn't answered me yet. So I'm going to try texting her again today and see if I can get her because I think it would be really awesome to have the author, the artist uh, with us. Okay, so let's look at the human design of the month ahead. Remember when we moved into um, October and I looked ahead and I went, okay, the sun every week is sitting at a gate on the spleen and the spleen being the center for survival energy can see those gates sometimes double up as fear gates. And so we began a discussion really deeply about fear. And we'd already been looking at that because Venus had also been sitting at all the gates of fear in the spleen. And then Mercury is sitting there. And so we've had, you know, fear up 
in our faces. And then, of course, Jupiter in Scorpio was helping us at this point, too, because we could take what it was that we saw as a fear and we could you know, reflect on that. We could see what is its effect in our life and we could choose consciously to move ahead because the beauty in the spleen is that the minute we choose to take action, the fear whoosh, dissipates, blows up, goes away, right? That's the, the beauty in the spleen as it relates to fear. The moment we turn around and we face it head on and we choose to take action or move forward, irregardless of the fear, it just sort of goes away, right? Well, when we look ahead then at the month of November, we first see this first week, uh, because the sun moves into gate 44 today, um, which is a gate on the spleen, which is a fear gate. If the fear is about the past repeating itself, like the baggage we carry on our backs, right? Bringing it forward um, and our hesitancy to um, partner and to be, to work in teams that it takes us into hierarchy sometimes. And so the, the real beauty in the energy of this week is that we can see when we work as a team, we can get so much more accomplished, right? Um, from there, the sun moves into the gate one, self-expression, which is on the identity center. And then it moves to the gate 43, which is on the Ajna, a gate of breakthrough and insight and intuition. And then the sun, love this one, goes, moves down to the sacral and sits at gate 14, the gate of bounteousness. We were talking about this gate because Jupiter was sitting there for a while. In fact, is I got to check that out. Is Jupiter and the sun going to be there? I don't think so. That dates November 17th, so we'll have the sun there, uh, but none of the other planets are sitting there. It's okay. The other planets have, you know, done their seed planting for us, and now the sun comes to the gate of bounty. Love that. Then the next week, it also stays at the sacral, and it's at gate 34. Gate 34 is the gate of strength, right? Not forcing things to happen, but holding strong and, and allowing things to happen. And then last week of the month at gate nine, which is on the sacral. So we seem to have sacral focus later on in the month and a smattering of other things going on the first couple of weeks of the month. And when I say weeks, I'm talking about human design weeks, which are a little bit shorter. They're five to six days. And that's how we can have what? One, two, three, four, five. We can have six weeks uh, in November of human design week instead of the typical four weeks that we have of seven day weeks. All right. Um, now, remember, <clears throat> in the way that I always look at human design, the sun and the earth, <clears throat> I look at the sun as the highest potential expression of that energy, right? So the highest expression of the energy in 44 is teamwork and, and synarchy, which is a word we've talked about a few times. It's a form of governing where all voices have equal um, footing and uh, where we don't have that hierarchical, I'm the leader, you listen to me kind of thing and, you know, rolling downhill. And of course, that's something we still have in our governments. It's something we have all over the planet. Um, that's been a real source of problem on the planet. So that first week in November, maybe we get this opportunity to see things from a different perspective. What would it look like if the two teams in our government, the um, Democrats and the Republicans, what if they work together to get things done? Oh, my God. I mean, in your own other, in other countries around the world, where would it what would it look like if, you know, groups came together and said, you know, we're going to work together to get something done. We know we come from different ideologies and we have different ideas of the how to, but we have common value. We want something done about whatever. Right. So we have that opportunity and we have that opportunity in our own lives. The earth, on the other hand, usually sets up the trigger within us to have to be able to move through in a positive way the energies of the sun at the gate that the sun is sitting at. Not because we're being punished, but because the earth is where we're grounded, right? It's where we live. It's the energy that comes up through us. Remember, we're our sacral chakra grounded to the earth when we're grounded to the earth uh, and, and, and that energy pulsing up through us, coming from the sacral and all the way up through and then out through the Ajna and back down just as it goes around the other way, right? So the earth is grounding us at gate 24, the gate of rational thinking or rationalism. Um, it's funny, I was going to look at what gate 24 in its highest was. 
I'm going to put this little cheat sheet up for you guys. This is the last page of the book of the Gene Keys. And in it, it tells you what the, the shadows, the, the, the shadow, the gift, and the cities are for all of the 64 Gene Keys. It's a great little, you know, cheat sheet. Um, silence is the highest expression of, <laughs> of that gate. Um, the shadow is addiction at gate 24. So there's a little bit of a difference between what human design thinks of as that gate. So here's how I would look at it. Addiction, rational. I think sometimes we are addicted to the rational mind where we completely want to blank out anything but what's logical and rational. And that isn't, of course, the best way for us to go. It, it puts us in our minds and completely forgets anything else that might be there. So uh, we may be challenged then in order to come up with working as a team by the rational mind, right? What's going on in our rational minds? Gail says it would be a miracle. Uh, we each play a part in building more love here on our planet. Yay. Gail also says in fear to change has held me back. Yep. 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 Um, good morning, Linda. Uh, she just woke up, she says, and she's late. And then she wakes up and I've been transformed into this beast. <laughs> Cute beast, maybe. Um, so now when we are looking at the next week after that, we look at the gate two, which the gate two is on the identity center. And it's a really lovely gate. It's the most yin gate in human design. So we're going to spend some time with the sun at the gate of self-expression and the earth at the gate of receptivity, right? So being open, maybe it would be a great, the second week of November, a great week to sit a lot of, spend some time in meditation, in receiving of information. Don't forget if you're a generator type, you don't take action on any of that until it's something in your outer world to respond to. But it doesn't mean that we can't be quiet and get into the stillness and, you know, be, let some things be revealed to us in the quiet. Um, the next week, the next four weeks are really, really interesting because the earth sits at the throat for the next four weeks. Gate 23, the gate of simplicity. Gate 8, the gate of contribution. Gate 20, the gate of charm. And in no small way of the gate of being empowered or empowerment. And gate 16, the gate of enthusiasm. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that it's all, for, all of that energy and the earth is on the throat center. And the throat center, as you guys may remember from many times me saying different things about uh, the throat, is it's a projected energy. So we have big lessons as we move through the month of November about using the throat center appropriately. If you have an open throat, even if you have a defined throat, the throat center works best via an invitation to speak, right? So when you have the sun sitting at gate 43, which is about insight, that aha, that epiphany. And then I want to share it. I want to move it because it's at the point of the Ajna. And I want to share it. I want to get it into the throat and I want to share it. But if you do that without an invitation, your brilliance goes unnoticed, unrecognized, unheard, or at least not heard in the way you think right? Someone on an unconscious level picks up that idea. And two or three weeks later, they express that idea. And then everybody in the group is like, yes, that's so exciting. That's great. You're genius. You're brilliant. And you're back there going, but that was my idea. I said that two weeks ago. Don't you guys remember? So it's it, <laughs> this is a cautionary tale. As we move through November, learning about the energy of the throat, and about using the throat appropriately. When we get to bounteousness, you know, and we want to be prosperous, we want to be in the flow of abundance. And the gate eight on the throat, again, is the gate of contribution. We want to be able to share from our gifts, right? We want to be able to share, but we can't just like walk up to people on the street and said, hey, you know what, I'm psychic, and I can see that you're going to have trouble if you get into that relationship. Uh-uh, you cannot do that. Even if you have a defined throat, that might blow up in your face, right? And it wouldn't achieve what you want, which is <clears throat> to be heard, to, to be valued, to be recognized. So the best use of the throat is when someone says, hey, I heard you were psychic. Do you have any impressions about what's going on with my life? 
Or you say to the person, um, I, I know you don't know me, but I'm a psychic and I have some impressions of things that I would like to pass on to you. Is that okay with you? You're sort of waiting for the invitation from them to say, yeah, yeah, I would love to hear that. So we're learning about the throat. Gate 20, <clears throat> gate 20 is kind of an interesting gate. It's a part of the manifesting generator archetype. It is also part of a channel that I think of as the Buddha channel. I hear about it called the Buddha channel all the time, where the most beautiful and empowering expression from the throat can come in and be received by people in the identity center. Um, but it can also translate down into the spleen uh, and it can also translate over into action. And so again, though, being invited in right? And gate, finally, gate 16, the gate of enthusiasm, it connects up to the gate 48 on the spleen, which is the gate of inadequacy or feeling inadequate, the fear that you don't know enough, that you're not good enough. And uh, that is uh, another indication that we need to learn about how to use the throat appropriately. So we're not just gushing all over, you know, and telling someone about something that they don't really want to hear. So learning to use the throat center appropriately. So maybe we'll spend some time with that. All in all, I look at November and I'm like, whoosh, we're done with the fear stuff, right? We may have other planets that periodically sit up there at the spleen or, you know, connect to something in your own chart at the spleen, but we're not dealing with as much of that dark energy or that shadow energy. It's not that it's not there because it's still there. I'm sure of it, but now we're more aware of it. Now we can see it maybe more clearly and we don't have to choose to allow fear to dominate, to make our decisions for us. We spent quite a few months, as it were, this year looking at that energy and dealing with that energy. So I would bet every one of you have new tools and new coping strategies and new ways of dealing with that in your life. So all in all, November looks like it's going to be a great month. And uh, a couple of blips along the screen as we go. That's the way it is. Uh, the first week, I think, is probably the most chaotic, if you will, and that especially in our country here in the U.S. where we have an election and, you know, that is, you know, ramping up for us, right? You can feel sort of the anxiety and, and you know, rising in what's that going to look like. I know I cast my ballot the other day. We do mail-in here in Washington. So we, you know, get our ballots and we check off everything or whatever. We mailed them in. <clears throat> Dip, been there, done that, did that. So I'm not, you know, that's not sitting over my head anymore. Um, but a lot of people are looking forward to that day. And there may be anxiety building up. But after that, you know, it's like the, the wave building, building, building. And once it breaks, the tension is gone. And it's almost like that whoosh of relief. And even if it's not the relief that, hey, you got what you wanted out of the election, it might be the relief that we're done with all of that. Now we can get to work. And let's hope we get to work in new ways, right? All right. Let's see. Anybody saying anything out here? Suzanne is sharing some inf uh, information about Samhain. Literally means the end of summer and is the third and final harvest. Other names for Samhain are Samana Day or Samana, Day of the Dead. Old Hollow Mass, Vigil of Salmon, Shadow Fest, uh, Sam Samhain, also known as All Hallows Eve, and uh, Martin Moss, that is celebrated November 11th. So is it, this is the Witch's New Year, a time for, for revelry and uh, introspection, and uh, it's a night for divination and honoring our ancestors. Ooh, I'm going to pull a card. I'm going to pull a card in honor of our ancestors and ask them to tell us what we need to know to get through these next few months. Um, and so she's done a really good job. That's posted in the chat. So everybody should be able to see it. Um, good morning, Cindy. I think I've already said that. So anybody else have any questions, any comments? I'm going to dive for my Oh, Lynn, I picked a card. Yes. Um, from the Wisdom Keeper by Rosie Aronson, she picked 16. So 16 is the gate on the throat center. And in this deck, it is called the gift of versatility. Uh, such a profound story, but I'll leave you with this from the guidebook. And again, she'll probably email me or send me pictures and I'll post that later. Um, it, it says, 
When I look into your eyes, I see a great potential for talent and versatility. I'm here to remind you, although talent requires persistent effort, everything gets easier when you take a stand for your true passion. Trust in your enthusiasm, risk being different. Gotta love that. I can't wait to see that uh, goddess. All right, so let me grab my deck down here. In the meantime, you guys can take a look at SpongeBob there with his little knife and his, you know, crossed out eyes. That was my husband's joke saying, you know what I was going to do? I was going, I was trying to find the song. I cannot remember who sang it, but it was sometimes I feel like somebody's watching me and I was going to have that playing with SpongeBob over my shoulder. So you could, so I was like being watched by this manic demon SpongeBob person behind me. Okay, so because it is a night for us to be very, the veil is very thin and we are very uh, much closer to our ancestors and our, our um, relatives who have passed on um, relatively close, you know, I'm going to ask the ancestors to bring us something that we need to know as we move into November or is it, whoa, 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 whoa. Did you see that? The card jumped out of the deck. I love it when that happens. Treasure Island, number nine, number nine, Treasure Island. It jumped out in protection, so it was upside down. So I'm going to read you the meaning of the card and also the protection message. Look at, I said it right. So card number nine, our ancestors want us to know, is about the law of attraction, bringing dreams into fruition. The results of positive thinking made manifest you know, um, that there's something really interesting about that because the throat center is also the center for manifestation. It isn't just about your voice. It's also about manifesting, right? Um, abundance appears as if from nowhere, financial gains and the sharing of good fortune. We've got to love that. So the basic meaning of the card, you've worked hard and acted upon your unwavering belief in abundance. And suddenly in the midst of it all, you hit the jackpot. You have uncovered the map to buried treasure and tapping the unlimited potential within you. What you must hone now is your ability to recognize when X marks the spot, because some of those golden opportunities may be obvious, but others may not be so readily apparent. Trust your intuition to light your way now as you enter this truly prosperous phase where all the long hard work navigating your inner life is now paying off externally. In all aspects of your life at this time, you have good fortune. Don't forget to enjoy it and share it with others as treasure shared multiplies like magic. And the protection message, because it did flip out upside down, you know, we want to take a look at what may we be tripped up by. And the protection message says poverty consciousness and a sense of not enough cast a shadow on your path. These ideas and core beliefs come with a high cost. Do you really want to proclaim yourself a victim of disappointment and failed expectations? Are you avoiding success because you will grow so tall that others will want to cut you down? <gasps> Good question. Or is it possible that you're caught in a fear that you will lose what you have acquired? So you hold on so tight that you miss the opportunities to expand. You are challenged to change the way you see the world and move from a perception of limitations to a perception of abundance. Take a risk, for you have nothing to lose except your confinement in a prison of your own making. Open the door and find the abundance waiting for you to claim it. Awesome. Again, this is from the Wisdom of the Oracle deck written by Colette Baron reed one of my favorite decks, and the card number nine. Let me see if I can bring it in close, but without the light shining on it. Treasure Island, right? Isn't that lovely? The back of a turtle. Turtle of abundance with a treasure chest. And love being released in the form of hearts and there's stars and there's gold and loveliness. And of course, water representing um, abundance, flow. Okay. Well, that is all from me this morning, everybody. Let's see. Is uh, Lynn saying yes, she will send a picture and the information for the card after the broadcast. I will then put that up on the site for everybody to be able to read. And uh, let's see anything else. Oh, we have something about angel number nine by Suzanne. She's such a great little, she's got it right at her fingertips, I swear. Um, angel number nine, nine being the number of universal love, eternity, faith, universal spiritual laws, karma, spiritual enlightenment, spiritual awakening, service to humanity, 
Yowza, lots of great things there that she's posted again in the chat. You should be able to access and read. Um, angel number nine is the sign from the angels that your life path and soul mission involve being of service to humanity through the use of your natural skills and talents. Love it. Love it. Love it. So mote it be. Love that saying too. Lynn, um, oh, okay, I already said that. Cindy loves that card. Uh, I love all of those cards. They're so beautiful. Both decks. I mean, this one right now, my favorite, but the, um, the 64 faces of wisdom, I think is what it's called. Fast becoming a very um, favorite deck as well. So thank you for being here with me this morning. I hope you all go out and enjoy your Halloween. Have fun, dress up, eat candy, drink hot cider, play with the kids, go out where the kids are trick or treating just to be a part of it. Um, don't, don't worry about anything, right? Today is not that day. <laughs> all right, everybody, Mwah! much love to you. See you all tomorrow. And it is what tomorrow is Thursday. Woo -hoo. So I don't know what we'll be chatting about tomorrow. We'll all be surprised. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye for now.